Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It is the 8th of August and some small but pretty cool updates this week. As always, if this is useful, a like, subscribe, comment and share is appreciated and hit that bell icon to get notified of new updates and live events. New videos this week, so I just released one. I know I normally do a couple, but I just did one because that one was nearly three hours long. So it was an AZ700 study cram. That's the new networking architecture design implementation um, exam. It's currently in beta, but my first attempt at doing an exam cram for non-fundamentals, and obviously it was just huge. It was a massive amount of work. I've been planning for over a week. So just did one video, but it's a biggie. Even if you're not interested in the certification, I basically cover the full networking set of solutions in Azure, so it might be useful just for general learning. Okay, so on to what's new this week. On the networking side, so the App Gateway Web Application Firewall, remember App Gateway is that layer seven load balancing solution. So HTTP, HTTPS, HTTP2, but it's a regional solution. It can provide an endpoint both internally or externally and then we can add the web application firewall in front of it for that added, added protection. So what we have now is this ability to geo-match. So that means based on kind of that country, based on the region, we can allow or deny. And I can mix that with other custom rules so we get kind of that net total effect. And also this bot protection. So this enables me to have this managed bot protection rule set. And then what it's going to do is from known malicious IP addresses based on Microsoft Threat Intelligence feed, we can now block those. And I think they've found about 20% of all traffic actually comes from bad bots that are scraping, scanning, looking for vulnerabilities. So by stopping them at the web application firewall, not only does it kind of reduce load on the back end services, it obviously improves our overall security, so all good stuff. The Azure Key Vault managed HSM now supports private links. So if you remember, Azure Key Vault is this phenomenal service we use for our keys, our secrets, our certificates. And the managed HSM, the big deal about this is that hardware security module, it's giving each tenant a dedicated security domain. So think of that as your own security world um, in hardware. And what that gives you is FIPS 140-2 level three validated HSM solutions. Now I can only use keys in this solution. Now with this now, it supports private link. So private link, remember, lets me project an instance of that service into my virtual network. And I can then use that via that private endpoint IP that's part of my VNet, from within that VNet, any connected VNet, or even other networks. So I just need to make sure I've also got consistent DNS resolution to make sure it goes to that private endpoint. So now if I am using managed HSMs, I can use that with private endpoints. Moving on on the database side. So the Azure Backup now has archive tier support for SQL Server running in Azure VMs. So if we think about this, remember storage has different tiers, kind of that hot tier, the cool tier, and archive. And archive's the cheapest tier, so it's essentially offline. I can't interact with it real time. I have to rehydrate it from archive into cool or hot. But it's super, super cheap. So what we can now do for that longer term retention of our SQL Server backups from SQL running in Azure VMs, we can actually now move that to the archive tier. Now the way that's gonna work is, it's only for recovery points with at least 180 days of retention left that have already spent 90 days in standard. So what we have now is a kind of a standard tier for our backup, and then what we're also gonna get is this Vault Archive. So we have this Vault Standard, and then we can move it to Vault Archive once it's been in standard for 90 days, and it has at least 180 days of retention left. Now, there are some kind of details with that. If we think about this archive, we want it to be self-contained, and we may have incremental backups. So when we move an incremental backup to the archive, 
but it will actually convert it to a synthetic full. So it will take all of the data maybe from other incrementals, other backups to create this full backup. But because it's archive and archive is so cheap, it's still gonna be more cost effective. And again, you want it to be self-contained because to use it, I have to rehydrate it from archive back into another tier. What they're gonna actually do is as part of the Azure backup, we have recommendations based on the various logic and the costing to say, hey, these would actually be good um, recovery points to go and move to that archive. So that's now GA. And then there's a bunch of features around the managed database, the open source offerings. They're kind of here it's the MySQL and the PostgreSQL. This is for the flexible SKU, so not the single server, but the flexible. Remember, flexible is based on virtual machines. I can stop start them. I can do things like use the burstable VM SKUs. Um, there's a whole bunch of different high availability. I can have a HA replica stood up. And what they've introduced is I can now have same availability zone, high availability. Now that's just for MySQL, not for the PostgreSQL today. So what this enables me to do is, as I said, when I stand up one of these flexible offerings, I can optionally turn on high availability, which will stand up another instance and have that replication. Now normally I'm gonna put that in a different zone, so then I get resiliency, but we do have the option now to put it in the same AZ if I want. That's obviously gonna reduce any lag as part of that replication. It now has private DNS integration as well. If we think about these have a name that resolves to an IP address, what it will do is actually use Azure private DNS zones to go and create the record for that database that resolves to its IP address. Well, I can link multiple virtual networks to that same Azure private DNS zone, so that will be able to resolve that database even across different networks as long as it's using that same Azure private DNS zone. And it could be a new zone, or it can go and use an existing one. So that's gonna be, if I'm, I'm trying to check the notes here for the name, so that would be kind of the Postgres or mysql.database.azure.com. And then also, there's this reserved instance pricing. I pushed the button too many times. So reserved instances basically say, hey look, I know I'm gonna need this amount of that solution, I'll get a cheaper price when I commit to using this amount for one year or three year terms. So that's available for both MySQL and PostgreSQL flexible. You just have to specify the region and the type, the performance tier, and is it one or three years? Also, I think they added more regions, West US and West Germany, um, West Central. So now PostgreSQL hyperscale 12.7 and 13.3 are in preview. So this is all about these new minor versions, the dot three and the dot seven. Remember hyperscale? This is about getting these very, very large scale instances of Postgres. So it uses Citus. And what that does is it shards the data over multiple servers. So I can just keep scaling out. So really there's, there's no real limit to what I can do with this. By supporting these new minor versions, it's really just new features, new bug fixes are now available as part of that kind of managed offering. And then Azure SQL Hyperscale now has these transactionally consistent database copies. Now remember, the SQL Hyperscale is different in architecture than the Postgres Hyperscale. What the SQL Hyperscale does is, I really still have kind of this one active entry point but then what it does is it has a whole number of page servers. So these are instances of SQL that connect to their own instance of kind of blobs, and it then kind of spreads the workload over those different page servers. So if I want to take a copy of that database, well, by the nature of all those page servers, it can operate in different ways. For example, if I was going to actually have a copy in the same region, I can use blob snapshots. If I'm going to a different region, well, I have all these different page servers that use their own blobs. They can all copy in parallel, so I'll actually get faster copies even when I'm going to a different region. Uh, there was also an update around Azure SQL 
Um, for IAS VMs, actually now show the Azure Defender for SQL as part of its blade. So as part of the UI, it kind of brings the SQL Defender actually into the GUI experience. And then we have the Azure SQL Managed Instance Backup Storage Redundancy Choice. So normally the Managed Instance, when it has kind of the backup, it's actually going to use RAGRS. So it's going to replicate to the paired Azure region where it's got read access. Now those paired regions are, are always within kind of the same geopolitical boundary with, the, with a couple of minor exceptions. But maybe there are times I do not want that replication to the paired region. So what I can now say is, look, if that replication to the paired region is not a fit because I have some data um, requirement that it cannot, some residency requirement, I can actually now change how it does the resiliency of that backup to be ZRS if I'm in a region that supports availability zones, so it has three copies spread over the three AZs for my subscription, or I can just do LRS, but I now have that choice. Moving on, so miscellaneous, there are actually improvements around VMware virtual machines. So this is the Azure Migrate solution. And now for both software inventory and the overall analysis can run agentless. Now the software inventory was really always kind of agentless anyway. So I can inventory installed applications, roles on the servers, features. It's going to work for my VMware virtual machines. But also now the dependency analysis, that mapping of well, what's talking to what, for both Windows and Linux, it can do that without an agent as well. So really just a lot of improvements around the Azure Migrate solution for VMware virtual machines to help collect that data and plan out, hey, I want to migrate those to Azure, including the Azure VMware solution. Azure Monitor dedicated cluster has a new minimum capacity reservation. So it used to be I had to have one terabyte per day. So these dedicated clusters, ordinarily, I create a log analytics workspace, and it's on a set of shared infrastructure. Well, dedicated clusters, as the name suggests, is my own set of infrastructure. Now, that does give me some benefits. When I'm running on my own dedicated cluster, we get features like customer managed key for the actual encryption of the data. So I now control that key in my key vault. Uh, we get features like Lockbox. Lockbox lets me actually control access by Microsoft support engineers. I can turn on things like double encryption. I get a price decrease, but also if I have multiple workspaces on the same dedicated cluster, we actually get performance improvements for cross workspace queries. Well, now I can get those dedicated clusters just at 500 gigabytes per day instead of having to do one terabyte per day. So if that was a barrier before that, hey, I wasn't doing one terabyte, so I couldn't go and get this, well, now it's lowered. There's a new API. I'll just have the link in the description as kind of detail around this. And there's examples for kind of ARM templates. But now the API for configuring query rules, there's now these new set of properties. There's simplified uh, action group definitions. So that is now in preview. And the goal would be start to move into that sooner rather than later. And of course, Windows 365 went GA. This is this new service. Remember, there's two SKUs. There's kind of the business SKU, which is kind of 300 seats or less. It's a very simplified experience. I don't have custom images. I don't integrate with virtual networks. I don't integrate with my Active Directory. It's just Azure AD joined. They have their images that I leverage, and really, I just leverage it. I just use that solution. Then there's the enterprise solution, which is more than 300 seats. I can have custom images. It integrates with my Active Directory, so it's hybrid joined, um, which means I obviously need connectivity into VNet. It projects network interfaces into my virtual network, which has some line of sight to my domain controllers. I manage it with Microsoft Endpoint Manager, Intune. I can integrate with things like Defender. So there's a whole bunch of extra things I can do. And because of that VNet integration, I can get to other resources in my VNet, connected VNets, or connected networks. But that is now GA. So you can actually go and get this. All the pricing plans are out there. And again, I'll, I'll put the link in the description. 
but these are all personal desktops. These are not pooled solutions. It's my desktop, it's licensed to the user, which means that my profile, it's not using the FS Logix technology of Azure Virtual Desktop, it doesn't need to. It's using things like OneDrive, Edge, Enterprise State Roaming to capture the profile differently from FS Logix. So just kind of a point about that. But it's in GA you can now go and leverage that. And what I'm gonna do is kind of a video, probably this week, about Windows 365 and those two kind of SKUs, just to give you a bit more detail about those. But that was it. I hope, as always, that was useful. And until next week, take care.